in the midst of hospital visitation one day, a dear lady that we knew with health complications had landed in the, emer in the emergency room. She had been triaged and was now lying comfortably on one of the cubicles, curtain neatly tucked in its place. And we had come to visit her, so we came in close by her bedside in her weakened state. She was talking with us. And we were just reminiscing about some stories. And if my memory serves me correctly, she was in the middle of telling me about some pots and pans that her dad had bought for her and, and how that she was using those for cooking. And in the midst of the middle of that little story, she stopped quietly and abruptly and said, I think I'm leaving you now. Unknown to me in the course of that conversation, her heart had slowed to a stop and now she just drifted away before my eyes. The next moment is lodged deep in my memory as our quiet conversation was now jolted into the state of emergency that we were in. Her body convulsed and literally in her horizontal position leapt from the bed and crumpled back down in a heap. I, I jumped to my feet and I shouted, I need some help over here. And Kathy immediately went into a little prayer service in session. And the next few moments were organized chaos as we were ushered out of the way and nurses were ushered in and equipment was brought alongside her bed and nurses came scrambling and people were shouting. And I, I moved Kathy and we, we just kind of, we were praying now and crying to the middle set of control station desks that were in the center of those rooms and I found a chair and she sat, sat down and I, after about five minutes the beehive of activity around this patient slowed and the nurse came over and asked Kathy if this person was her mother and in the midst of that moment our our Pentecostal vernacular made its way to the surface Kathy said no she's she's one of our saints see we're all normal that's normal to us but to that poor nurse she had no idea what we were talking about one of our saints. We still laugh about the look on the nurse's face as she tried to make sense of who this woman was and how we were connecting and exactly why we were there in that room. And I know you, I've left you hanging. But it was the next few words that surprised us. She said, well, you can go back over and spend some time with her. She seems to be doing fine now. I was shocked and I questioned her, she's, she's doing okay, like what do you, what do you mean, like what, what are we in for in the next few moments and because in my mind there had been a passing but with the marvels of modern medicine and a defibrillator she had been brought back to life. She had been literally before our eyes revived. My prayer this morning is that the sermon would be some kind of spiritual defibrillator in the room today. Because sometimes my concern is that in the midst of all of the chaos that's happening in our lives, there's been a cooling that's happened. And I couldn't sing the song loud enough this morning because it echoed the sentiment that's in my spirit. He's more than enough. He's restoring. He's, he's renewing. He's reviving. There is a God that's at work in our lives in the here and now. God just isn't some invisible force that's here when we need him and there when we don't. But God is active and at work in restoring something in the church that could have or may have been lost over the last little season. And I just came for a little reminder today that we are in a season of revival. I, anybody remember what that word might mean? It just means about a renewing. It talks about a restoring. It's about a lifting that's happening. It's about when something happens in our spirit and we get a little bit cooled off in, in, in a season of life. God said, in that season, there's an opportunity that exists. And it's something simply called revival. Revival. Could it be that the Holy Ghost could move into a room and, and when something has just kind of slipped away and, and somebody you realize, I think I'm leaving you now. Maybe your spirit has cooled off to the point that you're uncertain about what the future is. I want to remind somebody that the power of the Holy Ghost is here to bring somebody back, to step into somebody's life that it seems impossible and turn something around that in your state of impossibility, God said just a minute, I've got a spiritual defibrillator that I'm about to apply. The Holy Ghost is moving in this room to stir us up and bring us.
us back to life today. I don't know about you, but I need that kind of power at work. I need that kind of power residual in our, in our lives. God didn't come just to, just to see how many might make it. God came on purpose today to remind somebody, yeah, a righteous man falls seven times. But let me tell you what happens. He gets back up. You may fall one, two, three, four, five, or six times. But God said you on the seventh time, I'm willing to get you back up. You don't have to stay down. You don't have to stay destroyed. You don't have to stay in that state that's deplorable. God wants to raise you back up. God wants to revive us today. God wants to bring revival. God wants to bring revival. Would someone just shout revival? Someone add just a few decibels because the mask muffled it just a little bit. Somebody shout revival. There's a prayer. I, I don't know if you can hear it, but it's underneath the cry of the church right now is revive us. Oh, Lord, revive us. Whatever we lost in the midst of this season that we're in, God, would you revive us? God, whatever's been lost because of what we've walked through, would you revive us? God, would you restore us? Would you bring us back to that place where your spirit flows freely, where there's just a, an ebb and the flow of the Holy Ghost, of what God wants to do in our midst? We need we need revival we need revival I, I don't know but I I think that sometimes the comfort zone that COVID's created has allowed us to be uh, the Bible talks about being at ease in Zion Amos those words they come down to us in today and he said woe unto them that are at ease in Zion he didn't qualify it because of whatever calamity they may have, walked through, may have walked through. He didn't try and qualify their position because of whatever was happening in their lives. Sometimes you just need a, a word from God that says, whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa, unto you that are at ease in Zion. Because I'll be the first to admit it, sometimes it's easy to go into the church at 10 o'clock sharp and leave at 11 o'clock dull. Not in my notes, I better shut up. Seriously, we can, we can get very comfortable with that. But if you're, if you're listening with not the natural ear, but you're listening with the spiritual ear, there is a part of you that is so hungry for the supernatural that it doesn't matter what time it is. It doesn't matter how long we sing the song. It doesn't matter how long the preacher preaches the word. It does not matter because you're just saying, I'm waiting for the moment of restoration. I'm waiting for the minute when the Spirit of God sweeps in and begins to lift somebody up out of that place where they had been stuck, where they had stopped, where they had got turned around or turned back. I'm talking about what happens when God revives his church whoa unto them that are at ease in Zion unto the church of the angel in, uh, unto the angel of the church in Sardis right ye, ye, these things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars I know thy works that thou hast the name that thou livest and art dead be watchful some would say whoa and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die for I have not found thy works perfect before God you see, Sardis represents the human experience that we all know. The older we get, the slower we get. There's a few exceptions to the rule, but I think I got a positive amen there. Our bones ache, our skin sags, our hair turns gray or turns loose. And so in the natural, as we observe the human experience, the longer that we go along, the less life we've got. Not so in the supernatural. Not so when it comes to the spiritual work that God does in hearts. Some of the strongest spiritual people in the room are some of the weakest in the physical, natural. The supernatural strength that some people have in that prayer realm or in that supernatural realm is so strong because as they near the end of this natural life, this flesh may become weaker, but that spirit man gets stronger. That spirit man gets bolder. That spiritual self in somebody, as that flesh begins to diminish, 
diminish. You watch as that spiritual man begins to rise up and they become stronger in the Holy Ghost. I, I know I know what you're like when you get into a little season, a rough spot. I, I know we call for the church to pray, but some of you are making personal calls to some people with some gray hair in the room because you know they weathered some storms. You know that they walked through some valleys and they stepped out on the other side and their testimony is that God has been good. Their testimony is that God is able. Their testimony is that God can. God can revive. God can restore. God can see you through. I'm talking about some strength that happens in the supernatural realm. So church, as we just finished celebrating 60 years in the natural, if you're running marathons at 60, you're doing all right. In the natural. But can I tell you, in the supernatural, as a church nears that, uh, that older age, we're supposed to become stronger than we ever have before. And so we don't have to hang a shingle out that says we're alive, but really on the inside we're dead. We get to hang a shingle out and say, you know what? We're alive because we've kept a hold of this thing called revival. When we got a little cold, somebody got in a pulpit and began to challenge us to get up and get out of the natural into the supernatural. Somebody challenged us. Don't say dead. Down. get up and get out into the plan and the purpose of God I'm telling you COVID doesn't have to be the death knell of the church it doesn't have to be the nail that's pounded in the coffin of our past it can be the thing that says we got up and we got out because God had a revival in store for the church come on I got stirred up when Pastor Matt was just giving us the prayer request you, do, you just look to the north you look to the south you look to the east you look to the west it doesn't matter where you look our world needs revival our world doesn't need a church that's just kind of going through the motions. Our world needs revival. They need an apostolic firebrand. They need someone that's willing to stand up and say, not now, devil. Right now is our time. Right now is our place. It's time for revival. Jesus told that church in Sardis, he said, I know that works. You got that name that you're alive, but you're dead. That's not where he left it though. That's not the way it's supposed to be in the supernatural. He said strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. He said it looks like they're about ready to end their life. But here's your opportunity. Strengthen them. In other words, when everybody, the epitaph is already written. They've already determined that the end is near. You're ready to die. But he said, hold on. You have an opportunity. Strengthen the things that remain. Don't, it, it's not over. He said, I, I'm just telling you where you're at. I'm just talking about the position that you're in. You got that name, but you're not alive. So strengthen the things that remain. Take a look around. We got more than just a few things that remain here today. We're, we're, we're not in that, I'm not telling you, I'm not telling you that CCC is Sardis today. I'm just telling you that we've got hope for a revival fire to burn. I just, I just came to remind us today that, that it's time to have life more abundantly. I, I came to remind us that that baptismal tank should be almost empty. because we, I don't know if you saw a baptism that we had here a couple of weeks ago on Sunday morning. The water splashed out and up the wall. That kind of really bothers somebody like Pastor Woodward. He's like, oh yeah, we got to get I'm like, what? Let it flush. <laughs> Not in my notes. <laughs> Had a baptism Friday evening before prayer. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. If, I don't know if Macy's here or not, but we're celebrating what God is doing. 
There's just that little fire that's beginning to burn. I'm excited about it. We got more than just a few things that remain. We got more than that. We, come on, there's a fire that's burning. I, I just came to encourage us. Let's let the fire burn. Strengthen the things that remain. If Sardis had the hope of revival, then we certainly do too. We've got it. It's alarming that we can have the works, but not the life. And, uh, you know, I know that part of the sermon that we've got to stop for a minute. And, and you know, and <clears throat> before in our lives, most people in the room would understand what I said. Just we need to look in the mirror. But maybe, maybe this next generation, you need to, instead of looking at the rear-facing camera, you need to look at the front-facing camera. Don't know? We need to look at ourselves sometimes and say, God, where am I? Where, where am I this morning? Because collectively we can talk about our church and we can say, well, there's, there's stuff happening. But God wants every single person in the room this morning alive. God wants every single person in the room to leave Sam. I'm ready. I'm ready for whatever God puts in my path. I'm ready for whatever comes my way. I, I'm ready for God to do that supernatural work, not just through the pulpit or through the preacher, or the pastor, or the music team, or the, the ho hospitality people. I, I don't know. God wants to do that work through you this morning. I don't know if you heard it or not, but you can. You can hear the echo of what God wants to do in What's being said from the pulpit, you can hear it with your spiritual ear. There is a call for revival. Pastor Matt preached about it last week. The valley of dry bones. Live. Live. Prophesy, son of man, in the midst of devastation and death. Come on, somebody shout it with me. Live! Live! You know what our world needs to hear right now? They need to hear a shout that comes from the church that when everybody else is crying about death, there needs to be this cry that comes up through the ranks and says, hold on a minute, I hear something a little different. I hear something called life. I hear something about the opportunity to live. I, I don't hear all bad, all doom, all gloom. I hear about a promise that's coming down a dusty road of time called revival and there is a church that's willing to declare it today. There's a preacher that's willing to declare it today. Today. There are pastors that are willing to preach it today. There are teachers that are willing to teach it today. God, give us revival. Revive us. Oh, Lord, revive us. I'm thanking God we have. We've had five baptisms in the past few weeks, and we, we're just getting started. We got, we, yeah, we, we. Come on, I'm thanking God, but I'm ready for the altars to get broke open. I'm ready for, come on, I'm ready for the oil of the Spirit to be poured out. I'm ready for baptism of the Holy Ghost to happen. We're ready for it. Why? It's just a part of revival. It's a part of what God is beginning to do. There is a purpose and power of revival that God wants to release in a church. I know we've got some people that are here. I know we got some folks that are right here, but we also got some folks that are right here. You're just about ready. You're just before. You're just at that point where I'm just about ready to give it all to God. I'm about ready to become a firebrand. I'm about ready to release my life to God's purpose and God's plan. Not my kingdom, but God, thy kingdom. Somebody's right about here this morning, and I wish you let the word just be released in your life and let it happen. Revive us. Oh God, it's a promise that God gave us. There is a wind of refreshing. Joel chapter 1 speaks about the devastation that God sent among his people. But Joel chapter 2 speaks about the restoration that was coming. Joel 2.25, he said, And I will restore unto you the years that the locust has eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army that I sent among you. It was great devastation, but it opened the door for great revival. He said, I will restore. The restoration was right there after the devastation. We have seen devastation. We haven't turned a blind eye to what's happening in our world. We've had friends, 
succumbed to that disease. We have felt, experienced, observed, very close to home, the devastation. But God said in the midst of all that devastation, there is a hope of restoration. And that's what God just, he just prompted me today to talk a little bit about that. So we're talking just a few minutes today about the power and the purpose of revival. You see, revival, I felt the Holy Ghost right there. You see, because it doesn't matter what the devastation looks like. What matters is that on the horizon, God said, I've got a promise of restoration. And whatever was destroyed, I'm promising that it's coming back. It's not coming back just a little bit. It's coming back, pressed down, shaken together, and running over whatever you lost. I'm giving it back. And if God gives it back, nobody can hold back what God wants to give back. I will. God said, I will restore to you the years. So I came with simple de declaration this morning. The year that COVID has eaten will be restored. The year that fear has stolen will be restored. The year that was lost is going to be found. Those that have kind of fallen by the wayside, God is bringing back to the fall. God is restoring what was lost. I'm ready for revival. I'm ready for God to pick us up and turn us around and bring us into that hope that he has for us. Would someone just clap hands to the Lord? Come on, lift both hands for a moment. Someone, you just need to receive it right now. You need to receive a reviving. You need to receive a restoring. You need to receive that flow of the Holy Ghost that God has for you today. the spirit of the Lord is there's liberty it's here right now there's a liberty to walk out there's a liberty for chains to fall there's a liberty come on for bondage to be broken there's a liberty for those stocks and bonds to fall off come on Paul and Silas it's time at midnight in the impossible time at the turning of the day at midnight they sang praises and the stocks and the bond fell off revival happened at midnight <laughs> Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Rabatali kosa kalaka, mete oba kaleko shakaba. Come on, stir. God, stir the water right now. God, let there be a stirring. We can come back to the music. Hosea said it like this. After two days, will he revive us? In the third day, he will raise us up. And we shall live in his sight. Said a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as one day. After two days will he revive us. I believe that prophetic word speaks about the promise in our generation. About revival that God is going to bring. As one, anyone? Have I got two amens? Amen. If any, two or three. I got a three? He will revive us. In the third day, he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. I don't know if you can sense it or not, but there's resurrection power at work. Can these bones live, Pastor Matt? Absolutely. I hope you heard me shouting about it last week. prophet Haggai chronicles the return of the first group of Jews to Jerusalem from the Babylonian captivity 
Zerubbabel led that first group, numbered 42,360 people. It was the first year of Cyrus the Great, somewhere around 520 B.C. Zerubbabel also was credited with laying the foundation of the second temple in Jerusalem soon after that return. And without a doubt, it's because of the prophet Haggai that preached the word of God that got a hold of the governor of that group to challenge them to walk into the purpose that God had for them. You see, they could have looked at that season of return and the loss of captivity as their opportunity for them to grow personally, their bank accounts to to be improved, their life and future to be altered. And they could have just lived in the simple hope of the promised land that they came back to. But it was the word of God that came through that prophet that challenged them. You see, he said, you know, that's where we get the the statement, putting everything into a bag with holes. The prophet said that. He said, it's time for you, O ye. He said, ye that dwell in your sealed houses, but God's house is lying in waste. He said, now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You've sown much, but you brought in little. Ye eat, but you don't have enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there's none warm. There, he that earns wages, he earns wages to put into a bag of holes. There's kind of action without traction, gumption without function. A bunch of noise that yields nothing. But Haggai didn't stop there. He said, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. He said, go up to the mountain, bring wood, and build the house, and, and I will take pleasure in it. And I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Ye looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts? Because my house is lying in waste, and ye run every man unto his own house. Therefore, the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. He said, you got it wrong. Your, your focus is in the wrong direction. You're putting all of your hope in yourself and your own future and the work of your own hands and it's emptiness. You're not ever going to provide. You're going to forever be without unless, unless you start going in the right direction. God said, build my house and I'll take care of your house. God said, build, uh, follow my plan and I'll take care of your plans. God said, get up there and and get on that mountain and begin to build my house and watch what happens. And so the governor, the priesthood, the people are all in that position where they've got the word, but what are they going to do with it? But Haggai 1 verse 12 gives us this word. I love it. It says, then Zerubbabel, governor, and Joshua, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, listen, obey the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet. As their Lord, as the Lord their God had sent them, and the people did fear the Lord. And then spoke Haggai the Lord's messenger in the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I am with you, saith the Lord. Now here, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the, the son of, of whoever that is, Shealtiel, the governor of Judah. And the Lord stirred up, got this one, the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest. And the spirit, listen, the spirit of all of the remnant of the people. Something happened when the word of God went forward. That something was, the Bible says, stirred up. I feel stirring. I, I, I haven't come to say you need to get stirred. I'm saying that I feel a stirring that's happening in the room. I, I feel like there's been a response to the word. I feel like somebody has said they've received the word, but they're not just hearers. They're doers of the word. And, and along with everything that's happening in the world around us, someone's got their mind made up. God, stir me up. If you're looking for just one, stir this one. God, if you're looking for just one family, stir this family. If you're looking for just one church, stir this church church come on the spirit of the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel I was going through my notes and I thought God could you stir up the mayor of Fredericton I believe if we could get the word out then something wonderful could happen could it be that not just this pulpit but all the pulpits in our city 
could have a stirring if the word of God could come forth because I, I just have this belief in my mind I, I have this belief in my mind that that's, this building can't hold the revival that God wants to bring to our city we've got too much seed in the soil we got too much history in the ground come on we got a promise that's yet to be fulfilled and we are going to be able to maintain or sustain what God is going to do so we need every building that's available we need every preacher that can preach we need Come on, we need it. Stir up. God, stir up. Stir up the spirit of Zerubbabel. Stir up the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest. Stir up the remnant of the people. And the Bible says that they came and did the work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. In the most unlikely time. And when you don't expect it, God is going to bring a miraculous revival. Stand together with me if you would. Seven miracles attributed to Elijah in one verse in 2 Kings. Some scholars count more because they count his prophetic utterances as miracles, but for the most part, seven physical miracles. And Elijah, we know, bestowed double portion upon Elisha because he was there, received the mantle. When Elisha comes to the end of his life in 2 Kings 13 20, he has. 13 miracles recorded in scripture again more could be counted if we include prophetic utterance and prophetic promise and fulfillment but, but it's the 14th miracle of Elisha that occurs in this bizarre story some of you have heard of it for the sake of those that haven't I'll read about it 2 Kings 13 because in the most unlikely season when everybody's declaring death God's not done it says Elijah, Elisha died and they buried him and the bands of the Moabites invaded the land at the coming of, in of the year. And it came to pass as they were burying a man that behold, they spied a band of men and they cast the man into the sepulcher, the dead man into the sepulcher of Elisha. Just kind of like, oh, we got to get rid of this dead weight. No pun intended. Throw him into the sepulcher of Elisha. The Bible says that when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived. I don't know how confused that man was in that moment. The Bible doesn't tell us, so we're probably not meant to know, but can you just imagine with me for a minute? And out he comes out of the grave. And what was dead in the most impossible, uncertain season. When everybody else would have said impossible, well, the double portion, just shy, Elisha must have had some sin in his life. Elisha must have done something wrong. Elisha must have blah, blah, blah. No. No, God wasn't done yet. God wasn't finished. I, I stood in our office wing this morning. As a matter of fact, I got up, went down, turned the lights on, and stood in front of that cornerstone of that building that was built in 1977 for the stairs. I thought, God, checking on the name, making sure we knew what was going on. I, I, I just had this belief that what God began, what God has been doing, He's not finished yet. So I just came to declare to someone that, that thought, well, you know what? We're just coming in for a landing in the season of time. And we're just coming into eternity. We're getting ready. The trumpet's going to sound. Can I just say revival? Revival's part of the end time promise. God's not finished yet. It's time for revival. There is a purpose and a plan and the power of revival that God wants to release on the church today. He's just looking for somebody that says, God, I want to be a part of that. I need to be a part of that. 
Would you lift both hands? I'm finished. God, you're giving. You're giving us a little reviving in our bondage. God, you're giving that little space of grace. It's been shown to us, but you're bringing it. It's a reviving. God, you brought us through a rough patch so that you could show us your power. God, you brought us through a rough season because you wanted to show us your authority. God, you brought us through that difficult time, that season where it was so uncertain, that season that was filled with fear. You, you brought us through. God, we're, we're still just coming out of it right now, but you're not wanting us to come out into some liberty so we can live the way that we want to live. You're bringing us out into the promise, fulfillment, a revival for this end time. We prophesy today, God, release revival. Release revival in Fredericton. Release revival in New Brunswick. Release revival today in our Atlantic provinces. Release revival. But God, God, don't stop in the east would you let it God just like the sun would you rise on the east with revival and let it go all the way to the west we pray God let revival fire burn in our nations today give us that reviving come on make that prayer very personal for a moment we're going to pray together I'm going to open the altar just because we've gone too long without it. Let me tell you about old time revivals. They were, the altars were filled. You say, well, you're jump starting it, Pastor Jack. Yeah, I am. If you only knew how many things I ever jump started in my life. I don't think I ever had anything that worked right. Motorbikes, I bump started them more than I ever kick started them. I'm off my notes. But sometimes you just kind of going to walk into it or maybe get thrown into it like that that poor guy into Elijah's tomb you may feel like I'm just getting thrown into this that's all right because God wants to revive us God wants to bring revival God wants to turn a life around today so wherever you are whatever the state is that you're in right now I'm, I, I just came to say along with a whole host of singers and preachers and, and people that are in this room God is reviving us today anybody ready to receive revival anybody ready to walk into it I wonder if you just kind of step out of your pew and come to the front and say, God, my life, God, my family, I'm praying for revival. I'm asking for it. It doesn't feel quite right just yet. But God, I pray that you would lift someone up. They came in with the help of somebody else, but they're walking out.